So today uh, is a day in which we commence bi'ithnillahi ta'ala our study of al-Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari. And of course when we're studying al-Bukhari, uh, as I'll share in, in the coming uh, days, we're not going to be studying the original Bukhari, we're actually doing a condensed version of it, an abridgment of it. Uh, and there are a number of different abridgments of al-Bukhari, but there's one that I've selected, which is very famous around the world. It's taught, for those of you who happen to be here from Somalia, it's actually taught in Somalia as well. Sheikh Bashir told me he studied it as a child as well. So it's a, it's a condensed abridgment, a beautiful book around 300 odd ahadith. And it covers all of the chapters of Al-Bukhari. But before we get into that, I want to talk about Al-Bukhari himself. Okay? Because Bukhari is what makes Bukhari Bukhari. There are many other hadith books, of course. Right? But what makes Sahih Al-Bukhari so distinguished? First of all, you have to know who Imam Al-Bukhari is. So Imam Al-Bukhari is Abu Abdullah, the father of Abdullah, and he actually had a son named Abdullah as well. Not every time a person has a kunya, they have to have a child as well. Okay, But Imam al-Bukhari specifically had a child named Abdullah, and he is al-Bukhari, and what that means is he's attributed to a place called Bukhara. And Bukhara is in Uzbekistan today, which was historically known as the places that are ma wara al-nahar, whatever is beyond the river, and that's basically the Amu Darya. Uh, and uh, it is, the area is also known as Transoxania, and that's where Imam al-Bukhari was from, and a lot of the ulama of uh, hadith and lugha and many other uh, things happen to be from this region. And alhamdulillah, there happens to be a revival of Islam in, in recent uh, years also in Uzbekistan as well, which is a great sign, and the mausoleum or the qabr of al-Bukhari remains there till today. His name is Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al-Mughira ibn Bardizbah. This is the known name of al-Bukhari. And from the name, as soon as you hear the word Bardizbah, you know right away that Imam al-Bukhari is not of Arab descent. He's from Uzbekistan firstly, and he's not from Arab descent uh, because the name Bardizbah is not an Arabic name. It's clearly not an Arabic name. In fact, it is a Bukhari name. And the word Bardizbah literally in Bukhari language it means uh, it means farmers. Okay, so it's possible that the heritage of Al Imam Al Bukhari or the parents, the you know, the ancestry of Imam Al Bukhari ends up to some person who happened to be a farmer. And we're in farmland here, huh? So the first person from the family of Al-Bukhari that accepted Islam was a man by the name of Al-Mughira. He accepted Islam at the hands of the governor of Bukhara at, the at that time, known as Al-Yaman Al-Ju'fi. And this is how Imam Al-Bukhari uh, became known also as Al-Ju'fi. So if you see Al-Ju'fi, which sounds like an Arab name, it is. But this was because one of the forefathers of Imam al-Bukhari accepted Islam at the hands of this man and hence they kind of became attributed to that individual. It was an ancient practice, whenever someone accepts Islam, you kind of take their name as well. Okay? And Imam al-Bukhari, he, uh, he didn't come from a family of extraordinary amounts of knowledge, but his father, he heard from Malik ibn Anas. So that shows you that his father is involved in hadith, but he's not considered one of the elite scholars of, of Islam or something like that. But he's a person of, uh, of interest in knowledge, and he's a person of uh, piety and so forth. And he also met Hamad ibn Zayd, and Imam al-Bukhari, he would comment on this one specifically, and he would say, with his both hands, my father shook the hand of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. Okay? So specifically when it comes to ibn al-Mubarak, you know, he highlights that it was with his both hands, meaning that that was the type of relationship. And this is how close uh, his father was to Abdullah ibn al-Barak, or this is how close he became or came to him. And Imam al-Bukhari, he was born in the year 194 after the Hijrah, and he died 256. And that would mean he lived around 62 years of, of life. Uh, from a very young age, there was a number of tests that occurred in the life of 
al-Bukhari. One of those tests was that Imam al-Bukhari, and this is reported, he became blind. Okay, He wasn't born blind, he became blind. And the mother of al-Bukhari, she made loads and loads of dua, and she cried blood tears in order for her to, you know, uh, basically invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hoping that the eyesight of al-Bukhari would come back. One night, the mother of al-Bukhari, she saw Ibrahim alayhi salam in a dream. And he said to her, O oh you, Allah has given the eyesight of your child back. Because of how much you cried, and some narrators say, because of how much dua you made. So when she woke up in the morning, and she went and checked the son, Muhammad ibn Ismail, when she checked uh, her son, she found him that his, eyesight, uh, his eyesight is actually back. So this was one of the early tests of al-Bukhari and also, you can't call it a miracle, but a karama from Allah Azza wa Jal for the mother. That she made dua very, very rigor- rigorously and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned the eyesight of her son back as well. And a man, he came to al-Bukhari. This man is very close, by the way, to al-Bukhari. Muhammad ibn Hatim. He came and he said, I said to Abu Abdullah, if you look at any of the books which have the biography of al-Bukhari, this is one person you'll always see uh, speaking about Bukhari because they have a, that type of relationship. He said, how did the whole story of Bukhari, this great giant of hadith, start? He said, as a very young child, I was just learning how to read and write I started to love hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just placed this love of hadith within my heart. How old were you? He asked, inquired. He said, I was just 10 years of age at that time. Then I left the kutab after the age of 10 and I started go to, going to one of the scholars of hadith that was known as Ad Dakhili. And one day, one day, this Dakhili was reading the hadith to his students and he said, حدثنا سفيان عن أبي الزبير عن إبراهيم and this 11 or 10 year old boy at that time he stops the teacher and he says that you know Abu Zubair this guy he doesn't report from Ibrahim you've got something going on that is not accurate over here of course this is a young child the teacher he got angry at the child and he said you know what this is not your space to be talking okay so Imam al-Bukhari he stuck to his guns and he said that if you're not sure about what I'm saying, go check your notes and you'll find that. Of course, historically, a lot of narration would take from uh, what would be done from uh, memory. Okay, not all the time. Sometimes, depending on the teacher, right? Everybody has different gifts. Some people have very beautiful memory. Other people don't have that type of memory. So it depends on uh, the teacher. So some teachers would do completely from memory. This is one of those teachers. He walks back into his house. He picks up his notes. And he checks and he comes back outside and he says to Imam al-Bukhari, what do you think is the right narration? So Imam al-Bukhari says, it's not Abu Zubair, it's a Zubair ibn Adi from Ibrahim. And then the teacher, he took up his pen and corrected it and he told everybody, write what Bukhari said. This was at the age of 11. And he's basically just starting his journey at this point. And... And then, of course, uh, up until the age of 15, 16, Imam al-Bukhari had pretty much acquired all of the knowledge that he could find within his uh, city. Bukhara was not very famous at that time, by the way. All of these uh, cities, Wara and Nahar, Islam is very new here still. Okay? The Uzbekistan region at that time, Islam is very new. People have accepted Islam. There is the story of masses coming into Islam from Samarqand. There is the story of various uh, people coming. Fudayl ibn Iyad, I have a lecture on his life as well. He is from there as well, coming into Islam. But still, relatively, the Islam is still new in this region. So he took whatever he could in Bukhara. It's not that famous at that time. And he says, when I became 16, I had memorized by that time the books of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, that means they had books, ibn al-Mubarak, Waqi' and uh, a number of other muhaddithin as well. Then me and my brother, we ended up going to Mecca. Brother, mother and al-Bukhari, they all go to Mecca. 
All of them, they make their Hajj. Imam al-Bukhari, he says, I'm going to stay in Mecca. Mecca, I finally come over here. It's time for me to learn Hadith. So he uh, stayed in Mecca and he started to hear Hadith. When it comes to the travels of al-Bukhari, there are so many travels. And, and one of the things that I did is, I, I calculated the distance between Bukhara, his homeland, and every city that he goes to, based on the modern routes, of course, right? So, uh, I'll give you each one of the cities with the distance. Now, of course, this doesn't mean he's literally traveling this distance, because sometimes in one travel, he's knocking out more than one city, right? But still, it gives you an idea of how far he's willing to go. So, he goes to a place called Belkh, which is still called Belkh as well. And that is 551 kilometers away from his original city, Bukhara, and he goes to a place called Maru, which is known as Marv today, and it is uh, still around, it's 359 kilometers, so he's going south, he's going uh, west as well, and he goes to Naysabur, Naysabur, which is 833 kilometers away from his birthplace, he goes to another place called Array, if you ever heard of anyone named Fulan ibn Fulan, Ar-Razi, Fakhruddin Ar-Razi, or uh, Ibn Abi Hatim Ar-Razi They're all from this place Ar-Razi In the Tawrat This area was called Rakis or Raji Okay And uh, And he went uh, To this place It is 1585 kilometers Away from His Birthplace He went to Iraq There's many So many travels of Al-Bukhari uh, You know To meet Imam Ahmed And Imam Ahmed, by the way, he was very keen on keeping Al-Bukhari in, in the city. He was very, very keen. He said, because he realized this is not your average human being. The presence of Al-Bukhari, yes, it helps him because he's getting the hadith from all of the scholars there. But technically, Al-Bukhari said, I never sat with a person except that I benefited him more than I benefited, benefited from him. So he's benefiting the, from the teachers of his. But at the same time, he's giving them back their hadith as well. And that's why sometimes, and there's so many stories of the perfect memory of Al-Bukhari. He would go to a city, he would sit with the people, he's talking to them. They say, give us hadith of yours. He says, okay, I'll give you a hadith or a bunch of a hadith. But the way I'll do it is, in one of the beautiful stories, in one of the cities he goes and he tells the people the hadith that they have. And he says, you guys in this city narrate this hadith with this chain. Remember, every city has different chains of narrator, narrations because they have different shuyukh, right? So, he says, you guys narrate this hadith from this chain and the one you don't have is this one. So he not only knows the hadith that they have, he knows the hadith that they have and knows the one that they don't have as well. Okay? So he narrates the one they have and he gives them the one they don't have as well. He gives them more than they need. He also went to the city of Baghdad. You're from Baghdad? Alhamdulillah. So he went to the city of Baghdad and that was 2,475 uh, 2, kilometers away from his, uh, his birthplace. And there he learned from a number of teachers. I could list the teachers of Al-Bukhari, but really uh, Bukhari outshines most, if not all of his teachers. But one of the teachers that is really important is, of course, Imam Ahmed. And he went to also the city of Al-Basra, which is 2,499 kilometers, 2,499 kilometers of distance away from uh, his, his birthplace. Now, there's something important here, by the way. What's important? These numbers, they, they don't mean much. They don't really mean too much to you and I. How much is it from Toronto to here? 3,000 something kilometers. Toronto to here over uh, 3,600? 3,600 kilometers. If you guys know, I also made the journey from Toronto to here, 3,600 kilometers. And it took five days. But for him to go one day worth of journey, it takes a substantial amount of time. Okay? It's going to take him quite a bit of time to handle just 80 kilometers at least one day or, or maybe more, okay? So if you do the math, that means literally one month of traveling if he's actually going from Bukhara to there. It's not going to be, you know, you're cutting eight, nine hundred kilometers a day. It doesn't work like that. Or a thousand kilometers, depending on how much you're driving. No, no, no. This is serious travels we're talking about. And, of course, 
We don't have necessarily paved roads. Uh, the, the journey is a very difficult one. You don't know if you're going to have a bandit in the way. There's a lot of robberies that used to take place, right? So this is not even, there's a safety issue on all of this as well. And then he went to Kufa, which is 2,638 kilometers. But keep in mind again, a lot of these cities, he's knocking them out together because they're not far from one another. I'm just giving you the central point and how far he, he actually went. Okay? And he went to also the city of Mecca for knowledge, 4,000 kilometers away from his uh, place. And he went to Medina, again around 3,700 kilometers. Egypt, more than 4,000, 4,200 kilometers. All of these cities is going to the scholars of these cities and he's taking the hadith from them. He also went to Asham. These are all the travels. Some people actually in his time, they said that there was no one more traveled for the sake of hadith than Bukhari. Because he went to every single town. And the knowledge that he had of these towns, like it's, it's incredible. There was one Sahabi who, his teacher Ishaq ibn Rahawi, did not know the nisbah of. Ishaq is a big scholar. He's the reason why Imam al-Bukhari wrote his uh, book because he was one of the people who suggested it. So, he said, and Abu Abdullah is sitting there, he said, Bukhari, Muhammad, do you know this particular town? And Imam al-Bukhari says, yes, a small village in Yemen. And it's like a very strange nisbah. Okay? So even Ishaq was puzzled. He said, like you grew up with them or something? He literally said something to this effect. He said, did you kind of grow up with these people? Like, how do you know this? So Imam al-Bukhari, his knowledge of just history, his knowledge of ge geography, it, it was really puzzling uh, how much he knew of all of these things. And obviously, uh, this would mean that he would be meeting people and getting all of the information from them. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not like he can just log into Wikipedia and get this information. He's literally meeting individuals and he's getting the information firsthand from them. And he actually tells us of this as well in one of the uh, narrations from him that every time I would meet a person and I would take their hadith, I would ask them a number of different questions. I would ask them of their nisbah, their name, their lineage, who they took from, who their students are. So you basically document a biography of the person. Okay? This is one of the practices of Bukhari. That's why when some strange attribution comes, some strange uh, country name comes or village name comes, he knows it because he must have, might have met someone from there. Right? And then he said, if the scholar that I was taking from, he was a smart guy, I would let him narrate just like that. If the person was not fahim, those were his words, you know, I would ask him, take out your book and I would read directly from his book. Because he wanted to make sure that there's not a single error that's being narrated. And then he said, this is how I used to write hadith. As for there are other people out there who are writing hadith and they don't check anything. I don't know what they're writing and what they're not writing. These are literally his words. And Bukhari, he said, that when he entered Belkh, which was one of the early cities that I mentioned, when he mentioned there, when he uh, entered Belkh, he said, the people of Belkh, they asked me to give them hadith, and I gave them, and they, they t told me, give me hadith, give us hadith from every single narrator that you narrate from. Okay, basically every scholar that you ever learned from. So he said, I gave them one thousand a hadith from one thousand scholars. So towards the end of his life, this number became a little bit more. Okay. So towards the end of his life, right before his death, about a month before, he he said himself verbally, these are his words. He said, I wrote from one thousand and eighty different teachers. He wrote down hadith from one thousand and eighty different teachers. And what does it mean that he wrote down hadith? When he's saying wrote, he doesn't physically mean wrote because many times Al-Bukhari would just rely on memory. Okay? He would rely on memory to some degree. Because he's so busy with traveling, going here, going there, and uh, engaged in authoring because he's written a number of books. Tariq is one of them. And his Al-Jami' Al-Sahih is another one. So, and Al-Adab Al-Mufrad is another one. Khalqa Fa'al Ibad is another one. So he has a number of different books. He's busy writing these books in his travels as well. He relies a little bit on memory, 
And then whenever he gets a moment, let's say he gets to some place and he now settles down, he then takes the pen and actually pens things down as well. So when he's saying, I, I wrote them down, he's written them down, perhaps not at the moment of hearing the hadith. He does rely on his memory at that point, but, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the memory of Bukhari as well. But at, if, at the, as an eventuality, he goes and writes them down as well, because writing down, of course, is, is safer. And the students of Bukhari, again, there are so many students of Bukhari. Literally, some of his gatherings had uh, 20, 30,000 students attending the gathering. So it's really hard to keep track of all of the students of Al-Bukhari. But there are some names which are very, very important. Among them is Imam Al-Tirmidhi himself. He's among the students of Al-Bukhari. And there is also Abu Hatim. And there is, this is a very important name, guys. Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri. You may have never heard this name, but this is a very important name in the hadith because this guy is considered the Rawi of al-Bukhari. He's not the only Rawi, but he does claim. So at one point he himself said that there was a number of people, a lot, lots of people took the Sahih from al-Bukhari None of them continue to narrate it on. I'm the only one who did that. But this is untrue. There are other narrators as well. But he remains one of the most significant narrators of uh, Al-Bukhari. So much so that he's known as Rawi al-Sahih. The Rawi of Sahih al-Bukhari. Even though he's not very famous as that. And, but that doesn't necessarily hurt. If he's not famous, it doesn't mean he's a person who's unacceptable. Because there's a myth that some people have. Every single person needs to have a scholar of the science of ilal come and say this is an acceptable human being in hadith. That's untrue. If the scholars generally accept the hadith of a person, that is enough of a reason to believe he's an acceptable reporter. This uh, is case in point. Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri is one of those people. And Imam Muslim as well is among the narrators from Bukhari, even though he doesn't narrate uh, in his Sahih, although uh, he is a student of Al-Bukhari, and some of the scholars, they used to say, If it wasn't for Bukhari, then Muslim wouldn't have been able to make it, basically, because Bukhari really uh, honed that talent that Muslim had, and Imam Muslim is a scholar in his own right, but remains a student of Al-Bukhari as well. Now, Bukhari, he traveled beyond uh, Mecca uh, and he talks about when he went to Mecca, I was going back to that story, he went to Mecca, he, everybody did their hajj, the mother did the hajj, the uh, brother did the hajj as well. He stayed back in hadith and then he said, when I got to the age of 18, at that time I started to write. I wrote uh, the books related to uh, and he has a number of books that which are still missing, by the way, uh, which are related to the Qadaya Sahaba, basically the opinions of the Sahaba, especially when it comes to the judicial views and the Tabi'een as well. And he wrote a book in Tariq. This is another one of his books, very famous, still printed as well. And uh, he said, I wrote this book by the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's nothing wrong with sitting around the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu so long as you're not worshipping the grave. Some people assume if you just sit around there, you're worshipping. I remember one day I was sitting around the grave of the Prophet ﷺ reading a uh, book of hadith as well. The Sharh of Al-Arba'in al nawawiyah by Ibn Al-Attar. And uh, as I'm reading, some person just comes to me and he says, you know, you should know better. I said, what should I know better? <laughs> like, what did I do? I mean, I'm reading a book of hadith. And because some people, they have this phobia and so they make assumptions about what people are doing. Imam al-Bukhari is sitting by the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. He wrote all of his tarikh over there as well. Because technically that area is, as the Prophet called it himself, rawdatun min riyadul jannah. It's a garden from the gardens of heaven. Right? And, and so everybody wishes to remain within that area. And Imam al-Bukhari, when he was writing this, uh, this tarikh, he didn't include every... He himself said, I didn't include everything in this book because every time I see a name, he has amazing memory, picture perfect memory, literally, and photographic memory. So Imam al-Bukhari, he says, every time I see a name, I see, remember a story about this name. So I couldn't add every story that I heard about every single time I would see a, a name. And then he said, I would go to the... 
This is him narrating his own life, by the way. I'm literally translating it out for you. He said, then I went to the fuqaha in Egypt, uh, in uh, Maru. And I was a child at that time. And I was very, very uh, shy to say salam to them. So one of them, uh, one of them, he said that, how much hadith have you written today? I said, I've written two hadith at this point. Two hadith up until this day. And all the students in the gathering, they started to laugh. So then the Shaykh, he said, guys, relax. Maybe if you laugh at him today, there will be a day that he'll be laughing back at you as well. Now, Imam al-Bukhari, when he writes two hadith, they've been written in his memory for, uh, for the rest of his life pretty much, right? Because of this memory of Bukhari, because of this knowledge of Bukhari, and it's not only memory. Imam al-Bukhari is distinguished from all of his peers in hadith from the Kutub al-Sitta, maybe with the exception of al-Tirmidhi, but he's a student of al-Bukhari, remember that. Um, that he has the hadith and he has also the understanding of the hadith as well. Imam al-Bukhari has pretty much his own madhab. No, no, not pretty much. He has his own madhab. He has his own opinions on so many different issues. If you look in the books of fiqh, especially those which happen to be encyclopedia, they often say this is the opinion of al-Bukhari. Of course, not as often as the other famous fuqaha, but they will say this is the opinion of al-Bukhari. Sometimes it's out of the four madahib as well. And there are many such opinions of al-Bukhari. Some of these opinions, not all of them, some of these opinions can be found in the chapter titles that al-Bukhari gives. As they say, fiqh al-Bukhari fi tarajimihi. That the fiqh of Bukhari happens to be in his... Uh, chapter headings, but it's not always the case. Sometimes these opinions of al-Bukhari have been reported in the books of history. Sometimes these opinions of al-Bukhari have been uh, recorded in other ways as well. So, because of this knowledge of al-Bukhari, specifically when it comes to his memory and his hadith, even his own teachers, they really started to result to him. So many of his teachers, not just one. I can give you one story, but there really are so many stories. People would literally come to Al-Bukhari in every city he would go. They would bring him his books. One person said, I'll give you everything I own. (laughs) I'll give you literally everything I own. And Bukhari, by the way, he had his finances figured out. I'll talk about that in a minute. So, uh, I'll give you everything I own if you just take my book and correct it for me. Because if On this book, he gets the honor of writing edited by Al-Bukhari. You can just imagine what would happen to this book, right? Even till today, if we have those editorials and it's edited by XYZ, uh, it becomes uh, something that is noteworthy and people do buy it just because of that name. Now, these people, they would come to him uh, in dozens. And these are only incidents that we have recorded. There probably are hundreds of incidents like this, where they would say, can you just read the book and correct it for me now? And one of those incidents, uh, not of a book, but uh, is that Imam al-Bukhari, he went to his teacher al-Humaydi. He's his teacher. And he was around 18 years of age. And there was another person there who disagreed with him about a hadith that al-Humaydi was uh, reporting. So as soon as al-Humaydi saw that Bukhari is coming, he said, there is the guy who's going to tell us who's right. This is his teacher. He says, there is the guy who will... Uh, tell us who's right. And then when they shared the hadith, uh, Imam al-Bukhari said, Al-Humaydi, you, ha- you are happen to be the right one. And al-Bukhari said, if the other person continues to insist on what he was saying, he would become a disbeliever. I don't know exactly the hadith. We don't have records of that. Uh, but uh, it must have been something very, very serious for al-Bukhari to make a comment of that nature as well. Okay? Another thing, and this tells you another reason or clue why Al-Bukhari is likely not of Arab descent. It's almost 100% that he's not. Uh, but one of the reasons is, uh, if you notice the people of that region, not those who have intermarried with Arabians that uh, lived over there, it, a lot of the people in that region don't grow beards. Okay? That uh, region, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, that region, generally you don't see the same type of beards that You may, for example, in Arabia or in Desi countries or other places like that. You won't say that that type of... uh, And that's why 
we have a report that Abu Bakr al-A'yun, he said that we wrote from Bukhari and we wrote at the doors of Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Firyabi. Firyabi is a teacher of al-Bukhari. Firavri is a student of al-Bukhari, right? So Firyabi, Bukhari is there to learn from him. But while the other students, they see Bukhari over there said, can you give us a little moment to give us some hadith as well? So they're uh, learning the hadith from Bukhari. And they said that at that moment, there wasn't a single hair in the face of al-Bukhari. And when they asked him, how old were you at that time? He said, I was 17 years of age. So by the age of 17, it it really has to be, if you're from some of the Asian countries or close to there, uh, Turkmenistan and these type of countries, that you wouldn't have a complete beard because that's the type of makeup over there. But if you happen to be from Arabia, most of the times you'll have a beard. So this is another reason I'm saying all of this because there are some people who say, because the name Du'fi is there, he's actually Arab. But this is not true. Um, and why did he wrote, write this uh, book of his? Okay, uh, And I hinted to it already. Ishaq ibn Rahawai. And his name is Ishaq ibn Rahawai and not Rahuyah. Or Sibuyah. Right? Because some of the people of hadith, they actually end up pronouncing these names like the second pronunciation. They would say Sibuyah or Rahuyah, but this is inaccurate. The reason why they say this is because they say there is a hadith which says Way ismu shaytan or it is a way happens to be a name of shaytan. But this hadith is daif. There is no origin of this hadith. It's completely unacceptable. And so there's no need, reason for you to change the construct of the name. This is a Persian name. It's completely known. The word way in the Persian language, it means uh, smell. And for those of you who know Urdu, you know, and maybe Somalian has it as well. You can tell me. What is uh, apple? How do you say apple in Somalian? Tufah. So that's Arabic. <laughs> okay. So, well, the Arabs... And the Somalians are getting along over there, and the Persians and the you know Urdu speaking people are getting along over here because apple is sab in Urdu. Also in Persian, it's sab sab as well. So see, bawai is the smell of sab, the smell of tufah, the smell of an apple. Ishaq ibn Rahawi is the same story. So his name is Ishaq ibn Rahawi, and he said that. As they were sitting in the gathering, Ishaq ibn Rahawai, he said, it's a good idea if you take a book and you bring together all of the sunan of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam within that book. So that moment of Bukhari said, you know, this idea completely got settled into my mind. I decided this is something I'm going to do. He kept it to himself. But as time passed, he started working on this book. This was the reason why Al-Imam al-Bukhari, he wrote this book. And this is why... Uh, when you're teaching, give ideas. Even if you can't do it. Ishaq ibn Rahawai, he might have thought about doing it himself. But you know, age gets to you and you have other things to do. So he said, let me give the students this idea. Ishaq ibn Rahawai, he did that. And his student, Al-Bukhari, ended up picking it up. And he did uh, write this book as well. Notice, he's saying a book which is authentic. Because there are already books of hadith which are written by this time. There are books of hadith which are already written. Imam Malik, he wrote his book. Imam Ahmad, he wrote his Musnad by this time. And there are so many hadith books actually by this time already written. But one that happens to be completely authentic and one that gathers on a chapter basis, on a chapter basis, the uh, Sunan of the Prophet wasallam. this is literally the first one of its kind. And it is the most authentic. And nobody ever was able to come really, really and challenge Al-Bukhari in this. Even though other people tried, uh, and there are so many books written around the topic of uh, Al-Bukhari. Some of the people, they'll take the book of Al-Bukhari and they'll say that we're going to uh, collect the ahadith that Bukhari missed. Now, Bukhari didn't miss these ahadith, so to speak. He knew they existed, but he had chosen for his book to literally bring bring the A-grade muhaddithin. He wanted to bring the Creme de la creme, the best of the best, the cream of the crop. He wanted to bring the people who would be considered the uh, elites, 
And that's the reason why Al-Bukhari stuck to those hadith. You, you know, I'll share some of that with you as well. And every single time Al-Bukhari would choose a hadith, he would do istikhara. Okay? Every single time. And he would do ghusl as well to ensure that his istikhara is done properly. Okay? To make sure there's no janaba or, or something like that, he would go do his ghusl. Then pray to rakaas, do his tikhara, then place the hadith in his book. Sometimes what would happen is he wouldn't accept the hadith. Do you understand? Because he said that I selected the book that I have from 600,000 a hadith. So if there are 10,000 odd a hadith in there, you can just imagine how many times you would have to do istikhara to make sure that he ends up selecting. Literally a lot of the day, uh, he's, he's sitting there selecting. And that's why many people that were with Bukhari, they would say most of the night, Bukhari would uh, be praying and he would be, uh, you know, uh, he would go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, wake up again, go to sleep, wake up again, and then go uh, and do his istikhara and, and go ahead and write uh, down the hadith. In addition to doing istikhara for every single hadith, he would also do this for the chapter headings as well. Every time he has a chapter heading, he would go and make istikhara uh, as well. And he wrote all of the chapter headings between the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and the member of the Prophet, which is again garden from the gardens of paradise as the Prophet ﷺ had called it. Okay? Now, as I said, and this is very, very important, not all of the, all of the authentic hadith are in Bukhari. Some people have this misunderstanding, uh, and, uh, or at least between Bukhari and Muslim, they say all of the Sahih hadith are in there. It's not true. In Bukhari, Bukhari himself tells us of this. Like you don't have to raise Bukhari even above where Al-Bukhari himself believes himself to be. He literally said that I didn't put anything but a Sahih hadith in my book, but I left a lot of a hadith which happened to be authentic, because I didn't want my book to become too long. These are literally his words. الكتاب. So my book doesn't become very, very long. And he wrote this book in 16 years. And he said about the book, he said, I've made this book a witness between myself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he believed himself to be a person of ikhlas within this book. And, and we all believe him to be a person of ikhlas as well. That's why it's a household name today. He didn't even put the name Al-Bukhari on the book. He called it Al-Jami'ah Sahih Al-Musnad. Right? And uh, it went from that to becoming Sahih Al-Bukhari. And people pretty much forgot the original name of Al-Bukhari. Bukhari was a person who was very, very focused. People in his time would be occupied. His, you know, his own colleagues, his own people that were his age. Young people like himself. They would be occupied in everything else. Bukhari would be focused, even on his travels. One of the scholars, they're scholars now. His friends are all scholars, by the way. They have to be. He's not hanging out with ludicrous human beings. But even among them, he has a type of passion that nobody else has. He's got a focus that nobody else has. So, one of the scholars, he says that we were out, we were out and about. And all of the shabab, they were going out picking berries. Al-Firsad. All of them were out picking berries. So, you know, sa'atan wa sa'a, give, it, give yourself some time. So Bukhari, by the way, he, he would give himself some time, but not picking berries. He would have more important things to do. So, for example, archery was one of the things of Bukhari. He was a, a ma- master in his aim. One of the people that would go uh, to shoot with him, he said that I never saw Al-Bukhari in so many times that we went out to shoot miss a single arrow except two times. So every time he would get right on the bullseye because he's so focused and so sharp, he would get right on the bullseye. So you do these type of things which are obviously uh, encouraged in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. But uh, picking berries, he doesn't have time for that. So this person, he said, as for Muhammad ibn Ismail, he was with us, but he was not with us. He was doing his own thing. He was busy with ilm. Okay? And he was uh, a person who would really follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ so, so closely. 
So much so that Al-Najm ibn Al-Fudayl, he said, I saw the Prophet wasallam in a dream. And you know there's a hadith of the Prophet, also in Bukhari, in the same version that we're going to be studying as well. رَآنِي فِي الْمَنَامِ فَقَدْ رَآنِي Whoever sees me in his sleep, he's really seen me. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَا يَتَمَثَّلُ Because shaitan doesn't come and, and take my form. So this is really the Prophet He uh, said he was walking and Muhammad ibn Ismail was walking behind him. Every time Muhammad ibn Ismail would Every time the Prophet ﷺ would raise his foot, Muhammad ibn Ismail would go and put his foot over there. What does this indicate? He's following the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ, clearly. So this is a glad tiding in the dream of one of the scholars of that time showing that Al-Bukhari is on the Sunnah. And this is very important because there were a lot of people towards the end of the life of Al-Bukhari who really... Uh, tried to sabotage and smear Al-Bukhari. And this is the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal in some of the slaves of Allah. And, and Allah has his hikam behind this, Allah has his wisdoms behind this. We'll talk about it when we get to it. Al-Bukhari was, he had a gift of memory. But he was keen on memorizing as well. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, yes, Al-Bukhari had a gift. It was clear. But he would work hard to memorize. Do you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't that it was all just a gift. He would work hard. And that's why a man came to Al-Bukhari and he said that, Oh Abu Abdullah, I heard that you have a cure for memory that is known as Baladur. Okay? You have a cure for memory that is known, for, known as Baladur. Baladur is an oint- uh, it's, it's a, it's like a fruit. Uh, I forgot what it's called in English. It's a very rare fruit. Uh, and they have a homeopathic medicine based on it as well. But the idea is that, uh, and it's for memory. It's actually known till this day to be for memory. So he said, I heard that you have some sort of, like a, some sort of potion that you're using basically to uh, strengthen your memory. So Imam al-Bukhari, he said, no, I know of no such thing. I don't know of anything that ends up strengthening your memory. And then Bukhari turned back to him and he said, I don't know of anything that will strengthen your memory more so than focus and continuously reviewing what what you have. Okay? So that shows you Bukhari has a special memory, but he's working hard to maintain it as well. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because uh, there is a gift. There's no doubt about it. There's so many uh, narrations that tell us that Bukhari was very, very gifted. But... Some people, they lose hope. They're like, oh, this person was so gifted and hence, that's it. I'm not going to be able to make it in this. But I did notice something. In the dietary um, measures of Al-Bukhari, they mentioned that he ate almonds. They weren't talking about it from a memory perspective, but we know that almonds do actually help uh, the neurological system. So it's possible that that was also aiding because this is literally listed as one of the things that Bukhari would be regularly eating, two or three almonds a day. Okay, So uh, it could be that this did aid the memory of, of, of Bukhari, but we go back to the reality that this was a man that was really was basically chosen by Allah. And I'll give you my reasoning for why I believe there was some divine intervention in all of this. Okay, What's my reason for that? This right here. This shows you that there's something really about this which is not normal. There is divine intervention in the type of memory that Al-Bukhari has specifically for hadith. Bukhari himself says, I was in Naysabur and papers would come to me. Letters would come to me from Bukhara, hometown. And these letters would be from my relatives female relatives of mine. They would be saying salam to me. And then I decided I'm going to write a letter back to them as well and I want to write back to them and say salam to them as well. And he says, suddenly I forgot all of their names. Bukhari forgot names. He said, فَذَهَبَ عَلَيَّ أَسَامِيهِنْ حين كتبت كتابي ولم أقرئهن سلام 
and that I could not say salam to them. And he said, but there's very little bit of ilm that ever goes away from my mind. Meaning, ilm I don't forget. But the names of his own relatives he forgot. So that means there's something really about this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through divine intervention chose this man to have an ultimate focus that would be completely on ilm. He himself is saying, there is no ilm that I'll be forgetting or almost nothing from ilm that I forget, but I forgot the name of my own female relatives. You see what I'm saying? But again, going back to the point, despite the fact that he is gifted and there is something divinely uh, you know, uh, clear over there, but not divine about him, divine intervention within his case, he is working also very, very hard to make sure he remembers, he's writing down notes as well, not immediately as soon as he gets the hadith, but rather as he says himself, that sometimes I would hear the hadith in Basra and I would write it down in Sham, in Levant. Sometimes I would hear the hadith in Sham, I would go to Egypt, I would be on a travel and I would write it down when I get to Egypt. So he's writing down a hadith, there's no doubt about it. And Imam al-Bukhari is very keen on ensuring that every single hadith that he takes, He's taking it accurately. If he sees a teacher who's an accurate teacher, he'll rely on his memory. If he feels that the teacher's got something going on, maybe he's forgetting something, uh, he has a tendency of misquoting things, so on and so forth. So Imam al-Bukhari says, bring it out. Let me see the book. Of course, politely, but he definitely says exactly that. Okay? Now, I mean, there's so much I can say. I'm really trying to save time at the same time here because Al-Bukhari's life really is, is a life that uh, there really is so much to say about. And I think that if we just did three lectures on the life of Al-Bukhari, we wouldn't be able to cover it because there's so much said about Al-Bukhari and uh, people, uh, they, they have such great honor for this man. It suffice to say that Raja Al-Hafiz, who's one of the Hufad of Al-Hadith, he used to say, this guy... He is an ayah. He's a sign of Allah. He would say this guy is an ayah from the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the other hafadhi said, I wish, and he's a hafiz of hadith. He's no joke. He's a big muhaddith himself. He said, I wish I was a hair on the chest of Al-Bukhari. Another uh, person, he said, I wish I had the ability to take a portion of my life and gift it to Al-Bukhari because when I die, it's just one human being dying. But when he dies, there's a lot of death happening there. A lot of knowledge is also dying with this human being as well. Bukhari, he said that I had memorized a hundred thousand ahadith. Now, when he says a hundred thousand ahadith, what, what this really means is, it's the same ahadith, oftentimes, not all of them, but there are a lot of repetitions in there. And those repetitions are coming from different chains. And he said, these are all authentic hadith. So if he's picked out, uh, uh, you know, around 10,000 hadith for his book, then these hadith over here, there are obviously uh, a lot more. All of them are authentic. Bukhari is admitting to the fact that they're authentic, but he's not bringing them in his book as well because he wants to pick the, the best of the hadith as well. Another thing about al-Bukhari, and this was one of the reasons why uh, Imam al-Bukhari went through a lot of fitna within his life as well, towards the end of his life. He wanted to stay away from the doors of governments. He didn't want to become a puppet for any government. He didn't want to come close to governors, let alone anything else. Any wali, any governor, any uh, leader, any politician that wanted uh, a portion of the time of al-Bukhari, Bukhari would completely refuse. There's one story, and there are many stories like this. One of those stories has it that one of the politicians, he asked for Bukhari and he said, I need something from you. He wrote a nice letter on the historical letterhead as well. And it's got the stamp and seal, probably you can imagine. And he wrote such polite words to Al-Bukhari. And he made dua for him, loads and loads. And then he said, he said that I need you to come to me. There's something I need from you. So Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Ismail, ibn al-Mughira, ibn Birziz, ibn al-Bukhari, he says that, Salamun alaykum. Salamun alaykum. I praise Allah to you, the one there is no God besides. But as for what is to proceed, I got your message, I understood it very clearly. And he said, وَفِي بَيْتِهِ يُؤْتَ الْحَكَمْ But it's in his house 
whoever has a need, you have to come to the person in his house. So he tells the guy, if you really have a need towards me, you've got to come to my house. I'm not going to go to your house. And, and there, there are a hadith, by the way, that basically discourage going to the abwab, the doors of the, uh, the, the, the people of, uh, of hukum. So because of that, Al-Bukhari is very cognizant of this, and he doesn't want to try this. One very, very famous story, which I'm sure a number of you already know as well, about the memory of Al-Bukhari is when he got to Baghdad. Every city he would go to, there would be great honoring that they would do of Al-Bukhari. Sometimes, and in some, uh, you know, some of the books have it as well, that in some places they would go, they would start throwing you know, musk at him, and they would start throwing flowers at him, basically greeting him in that way, right? So one of the cities he went to, the scholars of that city, they gathered together, they'd heard about this legendary memory of Al-Bukhari, so they said, they went there to Al-Bukhari, and they said to him that we've got all these scholars gathered, and we've got some questions to ask you. So they, what they'd done is, they'd taken a hundred ahadith, and these hundred ahadith, they had flipped and flopped the chains and the actual text of the hadith. Okay? So you had a text, and then you have the chain. You know how hadith works. There's a chain, haddathana, 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 XYZ said, uh, that XYZ said, that XYZ said, that the Prophet wasallam said. Right? So these are the chains. And then you have the text of the hadith, the body of the hadith. So they would take the body from here, and they would take the isnad or the chain from another hadith. And they would mis- mix and match like this, until the hadith became all mixed up. Then they got 10 people, and they gave them all the hadith, and they said, when Bukhari comes, we sit him down, you tell him each one of the hadith. So they came to him, they sat before him, all of the scholars of Baghdad are over here, they're all laymen here too, by the way. Because everybody's heard of Bukhari, Bukhari is this legendary human being at this point. So there are scholars there, there are uh, fuqaha there, there are potentially politicians there as well, there are people who happen to be just general masses as well. Meaning they are people who love knowledge, but they don't have knowledge. They can't really be the ones testing. You understand? So, they said all of these hadith to Bukhari. Every hadith he would say, لا أعرفه. I don't know the hadith. Then after all of the hundred hadith are done, Bukhari turns to the first person, and he says, the first hadith you said, you said it like this, and the correct hadith is this. Then he said, the second hadith you said, you said it like this, and the correct hadith is this. The third hadith, he said, you said it like this, and the correct hadith is this. And he went on through tester number one, two, three, four, all the way to ten, all hundred hadith. He brought the original hadith, and he brought that mixed up version of it as well. So the scholars, they said that, you know, obviously everybody knows Bukhari knows the hadith. So the, the, the shocking thing is not that Bukhari knew the hadith. The shocking thing is that he heard the hadith one time in a mixed way, memorized it and recollected it in the order as well. And then he went back to the right people, told them that the wrong one that you recited is like this and the correct one is this way. Because everybody already knew that he knows the correct hadith. This is Bukhari. So much so that one of the scholars of hadith, he himself as a scholar, his students, they went to Al-Bukhari and they said that our teacher told us this. Do you know this hadith? Bukhari said, no, I don't know this hadith. These students became so happy. Because they said, we got him. <laughs> Finally. There's something he doesn't know. So they went back to his teacher and when they got back to his teacher, their, te- their teacher, they said that we went to Bukhari and we told them this hadith and Bukhari said, he doesn't know this hadith. He said, A hadith that Bukhari doesn't know is not a hadith. The teacher himself started doubting himself. And he said, a hadith that Bukhari doesn't know is not a hadith. And Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he he was a man who was honored by his students as well. Specifically those who were very, very close to him. Remember, Within student bodies, there's always different types of students. Keep that in mind. There are those who are students and they are very promising and they're really going to uh, go somewhere, right? And then there are those who, they're there not for the long haul, okay? They're kind of there, they're going to stick around and then eventually they're going to dissipate as well. 
And this is something that you, if you're a student of knowledge, need to keep into your mind as well. Your friends, most of them are not going to come, come along the journey for, with you. Most of them. You can try bringing one person along, the second person along. They will stick around. But if you're serious to find another person serious, that will be a rarity. Alhamdulillah, if you do, that's great. This is one of those rare occurrences. If you find that, it's amazing. But it's going to be very difficult for you to ensure that everybody stays with you throughout. So those students who are very serious, who are very, very focused, they continue to honor Al-Bukhari throughout his life, even after Al-Bukhari basically became ostracized from society. And I'll talk about that, how he became ostracized from society. Uh, almost excluded uh, purposely from society. So Imam Muslim was one of those students. Muslim is there for the long haul. He sees everybody around Al-Bukhari leaving him. But Imam Muslim, he sticks around. And he was so in love with Al-Bukhari. And he was so in awe of Al-Bukhari. And he would honor him so much that one day uh, Imam Muslim walked in and he kissed Al-Bukhari between his eyes. And then he said, allow me to kiss your feet as well. Okay? He said, Da'ani uqabbil rijlaik ya ustad al ustadin. O teacher of all teachers. Ya Sayyid al muhaddithin. O master of all of the muhaddithin. Wa tabib al hadithi fi ilalihi. And the doctor of hadith from all the deep rooted mistakes and problems within hadith as well. So this is the honor that Muslim has for Bukhari. You might find it weird that he's asking him to kiss the feet. Of course, this is very strange because. This is very strange in our culture to honor people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's not haram to kiss someone's feet. It's also not prostrating to them as well to kiss someone's feet. I say this because there are some cultures in which some of the followers of their teachers, they go and kiss the feet. Now this is, I mean, I don't like this, right? Because I grew up in a different culture. But it is not haram. And it is not shirk, meaning they're not prostrating to the person. We have records of this even within the times of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een as well. Uh, so, so don't consider something that you find awkward uh, also awkward within uh, other cultures as well. I'll give you an example. Things have changed a lot. When we were growing up, holding hands between men was kind of strange. We all know things have changed quite a bit now. So I literally remember when I left Canada at the age of 18, I went to Saudi Arabia people would hold hands. It would be like a very common thing. And for me, growing up in Canada, in that era, this was something, you know, you stay away from me. Don't touch me. Right? So, when I went there, essentially every time someone would hold my hand, I would just pull it out and say, what are you, what are you doing? Like, why are even for you, they would try to hold my hand. I couldn't, I couldn't essentially do it. It was a very awkward thing for me. But then, you know, slowly I realized, okay, this is their culture. They don't mean any harm by this, okay? So the idea here is that cultures develop, they change, and things that are normal to you today may not be normal to your children tomorrow. Things that happen to be, uh, you know, normal to another society may not be normal to your society. But another student of his is, is Imam al-Tirmidhi. Imam al-Tirmidhi, he would honor Al-Bukhari as well. And he said, I never saw anyone, and this is a big, big witness by At-Tirmidhi. He said, I never saw anyone in all of Iraq and all of Khurasan. Khurasan is a huge area. It's not a very small region. It is a very large region. And it was a region where most of the harakah of hadith was taking place. Most of the hadithi movement was taking place over there. Okay, he said, I never saw anyone in these two regions who knew more about the ilal of al-hadith than al-Bukhari. What is ilal of hadith? These are like hidden, uh, almost like hidden problems within hadith. And the reason why this is very important from a tirmidhi is because a tirmidhi has a complete book called Kitab al-Ilal. So he's a scholar of ilal himself as well. And ilal is one of the deepest knowledges of hadith. You study that like when you're really trying to become a super expert of hadith. Okay, so he's saying that all of Khurasan and Iraq, there's no one that happens to be more knowledgeable than Bukhari. Bukhari had ups and downs. His, his majalis, his gatherings, sometimes they would be very large. 
Sometimes they'll be very small. So depending on the season, because of course fame of people goes up and down as well. He was a man who was very careful about speaking of people. This is very difficult for Bukhari. Why? Because Bukhari is a scholar, as I said, of ilal. And he's a scholar of ilm al-rijal as well. Ilm al-rijal is basically the science where you say that this guy, no good. That guy, accept him. This guy, his hadith is not uh, acceptable. So, the scholars of hadith, they noticed specifically about Bukhari that he chooses his words as carefully as possible so he doesn't disparage the human being as a human being. Other scholars, they're merciless in this. Kazab, he's a liar. Wadda, he's fabricating hadith. Imam al Bukhari is like, they, they, they don't accept his hadith. He has more mild words. But those mild words mean a lot. And Bukhari himself explained when I say he does, they don't accept his hadith, I actually mean this. But he, does, he doesn't want to say those harsher words about specific individuals. So he uses more mild words. And that's why Bukhari says about himself, he says that I hope from Allah that he will never ever hold me to account about any ghibah that I've done. Okay? Because the scholars of hadith, they have to kind of do ghibah, although their ghibah is justified. They have to say that guy is a bad guy, this one is a good one. Why? Because you're checking the hadith. You're making sure that the hadith is okay. So they have to say words which are harsh about human beings. But Imam al-Bukhari, despite being a scholar of hadith, he's extremely, extremely careful with his word choice so that he doesn't end up disparaging human beings in ways that, uh, that would be considered ghiba. Okay? Another one of the things about al-Bukhari is that Bukhari was a person of ibadah as well. One day Bukhari was standing in his prayer. We already know he has so much ibadah that every time he puts a hadith in, he does istikhara. That's ibadah on its own. At least we know 10,000 odd Istikhara is done, right? And another thing about Bukhari is that in his prayer, he was a man of khushur. So one day he was in his prayer and he got bit by a hornet. Have you ever been bit by a hornet? Do you know how it feels? I've been bit. I know how it feels. I went to my uncle's place one day. There was a complete hornet's nest. You've been, you've been bit? Okay, it's one of those things all the shuyukh get bit by hornets, can <laughs> Okay, so... I got bit by a hornet and it's really, really, it's not a pleasant experience. And um, yeah, you know, I, Alhamdulillah, Allah saved me on that day because I almost took all of my clothes off. Because the hornets, they got in my clothes as well. It was uh, really a, a very difficult experience for me. It, it, it's, it's painful, especially if like five, seven of them are biting you from different directions. So Imam al-Bukhari gets bit by a hornet 17 times in his prayer. And Bukhari doesn't move. Then after prayer, he says, can you check what was bothering me in my prayer? He felt it, but he stayed focused on his prayer. Imam al-Bukhari, in terms of his finances, A, he had wealth that, alhamdulillah, Allah blessed him through his family. And then on top of that, he was intelligent. He bought a piece of land that he would rent out. Okay? For those who... No, this was also one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ had done as well. So this is actually very, very important. Buying land, real estate. I tell everybody, you've got to get involved in real estate. You have to invest in real estate. Because that's, you know, the prophetic sunnah, Bukhari is doing the same thing. He would rent it out and he would take 700 dirhams every year from this particular rental fee. And that would be one of the ways that Bukhari would live his life. And that's how he can journey all over the world. Of course, he's a man of sadaqah. There's no doubt about it. Of course, he has other avenues of risk as well. Sometimes he, his payments get delayed, meaning like he's waiting for a payment and it doesn't come. There's records of that as well. Imam Bukhari said, you know, I was waiting for a payment. It didn't come. So all of these things happen. He has his ups and downs, but he has a stable residual income, right? You got to make sure you have that within your life in order for you to have yourself sorted out. You never know which way life is going to go, right? So get yourself into something that is, that is going to give you. Now, towards the end of his life, Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he had a story that is a very sad story. This is actually one of his teachers, Muhammad ibn Yahya, 
Az-Zuhali. When he came to Naysabur, essentially, Muhammad ibn Yahya, being a teacher of Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, he welcomes him and he says, come on in, and he tells everybody, this guy is the guy. This is the one. He's got knowledge, it's clear, he's got ilm, there's nothing like him. He, he points all of his students towards this human being. Now, when that happens, the students, they literally hear Muhammad ibn Ismail, he's clearly more knowledgeable than Muhammad ibn Yahya, even though Muhammad ibn Yahya is more senior. But because he's got more of a pull in the community, he is from there, he's from Naysabur. Bukhari happens to be a foreigner at the end of the day, he's an oncomer. He just came. So all of these people, they have confidence in the knowledge of Al-Bukhari, but they don't have the same sort of like, he doesn't have the same sort of community around him. Do you understand? So now, when Muhammad ibn Yahya, he sees everybody is getting around, it's getting out of hand, his own dars starts to decrease in numbers. So much so that nobody really wants to take hadith from Muhammad ibn Yahya now. At that point, Muhammad ibn Yahya, he causes a problem for Bukhari. Az-Zuhali is a scholar. May Allah forgive him. Scholars have jealousy between one another as well. Keep that in mind. You may see a lot of it. You may not see a lot of it as well. So he is a scholar of his own right. If you read his biography, he's a person of knowledge. But he got jealous. Everybody's going to Bukhari. Nobody's coming to my lesson anymore. Or my numbers are decreasing. So he picks out on the one thing that he knows. It's tr tried and tested. If you go for this, people are going to turn away. His aqidah has got a problem. So he says that the aqidah of Bukhari has got an issue. What's the issue? The issue is that Imam al-Bukhari believes that the words that a person says when they're reciting the Qur'an, the words are created. Uh, so, sorry, the, the, the voice is created. But Allah's speech is not created. Before Bukhari, Imam Ahmad and others, they didn't want to get into this detail. Imam Bukhari writes his book, Khalq, Af'al al-Ibad, in that he details this issue, and he says that, yes, the Qur'an is uncreated, it is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the voice of a person, the lungs, the, the air that comes out of you, that is obviously a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you understand the distinction? This is what Al-Bukhari says. This becomes, by the way, later on the, the creed of everybody. All of the scholars of Islam pretty much believe this today. But at that time, this was completely new. There was no one else that was saying this. Or if there was Muslim, by the way, he was among the people who was saying this. Imam Muslim actually went to Muhammad ibn Yahya later on and he says, you know, I say the same thing. He says, ah, oh, but you, you know, you're a student. Okay, let, let it go. You understand? But he went after Bukhari in this case and then one day one of the students came in the gathering of Bukhari, got up, he stood up and he said that, what do you say about the speech of Allah? One question, second question, third question. He asked him the same question three times. At the third Time, he says, Al Quranu Kalamullahi Ghayru Makhluk. The Quran is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has not been created. The words of Allah. As for the actions of the creation of Allah, they are obviously created. Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amaloon. Allah has created you and He's created your action as well. And then he says, Wal imtihanu bid'atun. As for you questioning other people in their aqidah, that is a bid'ah. That is considered an innovation. So this man, as soon as he heard this from Bukhari, he got up and he said, look, guys, what Muhammad ibn Yahya was saying was true. And he started causing a big ruckus in the majlis of al-Bukhari. Because of this, your aqidah has gone bad. And from that day onwards, it was downhill for Bukhari. Completely downhill. Imam al-Bukhari, literally at that point, you can, it's, it's clear that... Uh, Nobody really was interested in taking knowledge from Al-Bukhari except for a mere few who are left. A lot of people had already taken hadith, so his book is already preserved now, right? But because Muhammad ibn Yahya is causing this problem in terms of his aqidah, uh, people left him and Muslim remained. He used to go to his gatherings. A couple of other students, they would say that, you know, how do we come to you, Bukhari? We want to take hadith from you. But whoever comes to you, everybody else outcasts him. 
Everybody says this guy is off the manhaj, so we've got to outcast him, right? And some of them, they said to Bukhari, you're a pious human being, it's clear, why don't you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against these people? And he said, you know, there's a day of judgment, we'll sort it out at that point. And he would say that this is all from the plot of the shaytan, and inna kayd shaytani kana da'ifa. وَلَا يَحِيقُ الْمَكْرُ السَّيِّئُ إِلَّا بِأَهْلِهِ And the evil plot, it doesn't gather and encircle anyone except the person who's plotting. Now, if you think about it, if I didn't tell you the name Muhammad ibn Yahya as Duhali, would you ever know that name? No one knows that name. At that time, he was a very famous person. He was a person who had a huge group of people around him. He was the one who gave Bukhari the seat in Naysabur. Because Allah has a sunnah, you can try to fool people, but eventually, if there's a khlas in what a person is doing, it will show later on, and that's exactly what Al-Bukhari relied upon. He said, okay, I've done my, my, my due diligence, I've done enough uh, delivery of my message, and, and so Al-Bukhari now left Naysabur. He went back to Bukhara, he was, uh, he was embraced by the people of, of Bukhara as well, very, very heavily, they ended up making... Like people embraced Bukhari outside of Bukhara. Okay? Because, yeah, he got outcasted in Naysabur, but people of Bukhara still know him. This is his own hometown. Family is there, kith, kin, blood, everybody's there. So he goes back now to Bukhara, people embrace him, and most of the people in town, they come out, they start to throw everything they could. One of the things they threw was sugar as well. They started thro throwing sugar at him. It was uh, ancient practice and they started to throw uh, money at him as well alhamdulillah he didn't get hurt but they started to thro throw coins at him as well and people really you know they they uh, they embraced Bukhari in a very very positive way it was just a little while until Muhammad ibn Yahya al Zuhali strikes back again he goes and writes now to the Amir of Bukhara, who is actually related to Muhammad ibn Yahya. Okay? He goes and writes to the Amir of Bukhara and he tells him Bukhara, uh, Imam al Bukhari is going against the Sunnah of the Prophet. Literally. This person went against the Sunnah of the Prophet. So, Khalid ibn Ahmad, the Amir of Bukhara, he goes and he reads this letter out to the people in public and then he says to, the, to Bukhari, Imam al-Bukhari to actually leave. He exiles him out of the city of Bukhara as well. And then Imam al-Bukhari is in a small town and really from that point onwards there are two different narratives okay, about what exactly happened. One of them is that the Amir he wanted, the, the, the prince, he wanted al, uh, Imam al-Bukhari to come and teach his family, his children, hadith. Imam al-Bukhari doesn't have that same sort of clout anymore. People have kind of left him. So he says, he's still a person of knowledge. You come to my house and teach my children. Okay? Imam al-Bukhari again said, I'm not going to come to your house. The, the premise is, al-ilm yu'ta wa la ya'ti. The ilm is always, you go to the ilm, the ilm doesn't come to you. You're going to go there and it's not going to be coming to you. So he didn't accept this offer. He didn't go and teach the children of, of the Amir. And also he doesn't want to go to the doors of the Umarah, the leaders. That's another premise that Al-Bukhari has. So because of that, he got even further outcasted. This is one possibility. The second possibility is that some of the other neighboring cities, they did try to embrace Bukhara, Bukhari. But as Bukha, Imam Al-Bukhari was going to that city, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala heard that even the people of that town right outside of Samarqand they have also started to argue that should we allow Bukhari to come and he's causing fitna in Naysabur and Bukhara and all the other, other places should we embrace him in Samarqand at this point with all these problems eventually they decided let's embrace him let's bring him in so this is like all the debates should we bring the Shaykh or not right so they, they bring him in but Bukhari himself, he says, this is too much. At that point, Imam al-Bukhari, he makes dua to Allah. He says, Allahumma khirli, Allahumma khirli, Allahumma khirli. Oh Allah, 
you make the decision for me, you make the decision for me, you make the decision for me, and then Imam al-Bukhari was on his mount and he fell off the mount and he died. This is one narrative. That he died in this way. And they, the people of Samarqand, then they came to him and they, they took him basically for the burial. But again, this is one narrative. The other narrative is no. Imam al-Bukhari was in his room and he died on the night of Eid al-Fitr in the year uh, 256 after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he was alone in, in his house and in the morning they found him dead. Allahu a'lam, but we know that he died lonely, generally. That's clear. Whether that be him on top of a mount or him standing outside of a city making dua to Allah, asking him whether he should go to Samarqand or not, or whether it be that he was in his room and he was completely outcasted by society because of these uh, events that led up to that. Wallahu a'lam, we don't exactly know what took place uh, Imam al-Zahabi, he believes the latter. Some other scholars, they believe the former. But we don't know exactly what took place. We know that he died alone. And there was a lot of fitna that it took place towards the end of the life of al-Bukhari. And, but at the end of the day, as al-Imam al-Bukhari said, that the qaid of shaytan, as Allah says, he quoted Allah, that inna qaid shaytani kana da'ifa, that the plot of shaytan is very weak. And it was weak. Nobody remembers Muhammad ibn Yahya. Nobody remembers the Amir that had uh, exiled al-Bukhari. Nobody remembers any of those people. But everybody remembers al-Imam al-Bukhari. And that's why we say that ikhlas, sincerity, will always have the upper hand at the end of it all. Because Allah will give you the recognition even if people don't give you that recognition. When you have some special connection between yourself and Allah Azza wa Jal, you don't have to count on anybody else. You don't have to look for recognition. He wasn't looking for recognition, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. But rather, he had this special uh, connection between himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, we'll stop. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have his mercy on Al-Bukhari. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from the book of Al-Bukhari and the books of Al-Bukhari and the legacy of Al-Bukhari as well. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.